Lord, thank you for being our sufficiency and for helping us to understand that absolute need we have for you. Forgive us when we have trudged on, burst through on our own. Draw us to yourself. Help us to accept that yoke that you have given to us and the privilege of walking side by side, working side by side with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. You understand that worship is not something that we have, that we just schedule. Worship is something that occurs when we recognize our insufficiency and his all-sufficiency. Then our heart overflows in worship. Thank you for leading us to worship. This morning, um, we're, I guess they call this the last days, or the last day, or something like that. Anyway, um, thank you for, for pressing through. How many of you have been here the whole time? Well, that's most of you. Praise God. Thank you for, for your commitment to learning about how to reach our neighbors. I've learned some incredibly valuable things. And uh, we have more in store. Sean, there you are. We'll, we're, we're, uh, we're not ready to call it quits yet here. That's why we're here. I'm going to ask if you would remember to take your lanyard off when you leave. You're welcome, you're welcome to keep the tag, but we'll reuse these lanyards in future years. So if you would leave that at the front desk when you go, uh, we appreciate that. And um, it can serve some funds for, for outreach. Um, I want to add my thanks also to those that this is the work of, of many people. It could not happen without a team. All of the presenters, uh, the seminar presenters, the plenary presenters, uh, all of the support, uh, we want to say a thank you to each of them. Uh, it, it is Glenn's privilege and mine to work with, a, with great people, including our worship team, uh, the hotel staff, you said it well, they have been most hospitable. Uh, Todd, it, 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 I don't see Todd right now, um, but he was busy resetting things after our seminar, all of them. So when you see our staff, the, the hotel staff, be sure to thank them as well. And I'm going to do a call out to a friend, Kevin Vanover. He, he came in. He's a, he is a friend of, of our administrative assistant and came in and flew the, the um, truss here with all of the lighting and so forth. So um, thank you, Kevin. Uh, it's a... Uh, everybody's expertise contributes to this, so thank you to all. God is good. And again, it is everyone. And it would mean nothing if you folks didn't come. It would be nothing. So you're, you're what makes it worthwhile. We together are going to touch lives in our community by God's grace. So let's, let's continue. Let's, let's hear this very special message. And, um, and then, then we'll head into the, to the mission field. All right? Ah, thank you, Glenn. Alex, hold the strings just yet. <laughs> um, I understand that VOP is going to give away a series of the videos for this transforming, it's the transforming the, your, your church into a house of prayer? No, no. No, this, it's the, oh, it's the is, Revelation Speaks Peace. Revelation ah. Speaks Peace. 
This is the very special message. This is the Revelation Speaks piece. This is Minneapolis, uh, our, our latest series that, uh, that Pastor Sean did. And, and we've put that into a professional package because we want you to use this for evangelism. We already have churches that are taking this just like it is and, and do an evangelistic series. We'll support that with our resources. We also put out uh, some Bible studies that accompany the, uh, the series that you can use to, uh, to follow that up. And the best way to use this is for you to play the DVD and then a, co a host of some sort or a co-host or, or whatever you want to call it then would lead the group with the Bible study. So here's what, what we're giving away. We have um, five studies that I'm going to give you with one DVD presentation. Now, the way this works is you've been coming by the booth and you've been putting your name in this little box. I'm going to put these names into this bigger box, shake it up a little bit, and then have one of these musicians pull it out. And then whoever's the lucky person to get it, then, uh, then you just won yourself um, something. Now, here's the thing. This is uh, one of those things where you don't really have to be present in order to win. If you're not here, then we will mail it uh, to you. I hope you are here, um, but, uh, but who knows. And while I'm doing this, let me just say that from the voice of prophecy, anytime we see a conference doing something like this, where, where you are committed to outreach and evangelism, we just go home praising the Lord. This, this is what it's all about. We have to reach, reach the people together. We can't do it all uh, alone. And so praise God for this. Keep on the good work, and I know the Lord's going to bless this conference. All right. Anne Bichem, no, B E H M, or Bim? And Bim. Praise the Lord. Right. Good Good time. Time. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. <laughs> Praise God. And, there, and I, will, I don't know how many of the booths are still open. As this meeting finishes, check with them quickly because I know they will be packing as you will be packing, but check with them, all right? That's the other people we want to thank as those who, who brought information and resources as well. Uh, Advent Source, Voice of Prophecy, It Is Written, our, our uh, lit, Literature Evangelism, and Share Him. Father in heaven, in the stillness of this moment, the voice that we long to hear is yours. We understand that we won't truly see you face to face, visibly, until you come for us. But still we long to catch glimpses, and we ask that we would see your face and hear your voice in the words of Scripture this morning. And I'm asking again that you would forgive my sins and make me fit to stand before the assembly that you would take once more a coal from heaven's altar. Lord, I can't do this unless angels of God are in this auditorium, and that you would anoint me for this hour. And once again, we covenant that when you speak to us, we will follow, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We've talked a lot in the last few days about working by faith. And that's really the number one skill you have. Technique is important. We have been given all kinds of counsel as to what methods work best. But the number one thing God longs to see in His people is an act of faith to follow and do what He asks. And so some of the principles that we've talked about in the last few days, over the last ten years, I have taken them to the hardest places on the planet to see if they will work in the hardest environments. In recent years, I refused to go where I knew that the campaign would be easy. And so we've tried them in places that traditionally are known for not being receptive to the gospel or to the three angels' messages. And this morning I want to show you a little bit of what happens when God's people exercise that kind of faith, even in the most difficult places on earth. And I know that everybody's own community seems like the most difficult place on earth because you're living there and you're the one who's experienced rejection at the hands of your neighbors. Let me show you what happens if we follow. Oh, I can't put my glasses on top of the microphone. Every year 
or two or three, I try to find one Bible text that I hang my hat on for the next 12 months. And I'm going to show you five of my favorites. I cling to them every morning. I read them when I get up in the morning. That doesn't mean I can recite them by memory. Early this morning in the shower, I was trying to recite them by memory, and I am awful at memorizing Scripture. It is terrible. I can paraphrase the whole Bible for you. I can paraphrase. I have the Boonstra Revised Version down pat. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. I love this passage. In this passage, God says that He has put eternity in the human heart. Do you know why I love that? I can walk into a room with 5,000 angry heathens in it, atheists, and I know for a fact that at some point they have all heard the voice of God speaking to their heart because God has promised that He's put eternity in their hearts. Now they might think intellectually that this world is all there is, and that when you die, that's the end. There is no more. That's what they tell themselves up here in their minds. But I've noticed something very interesting at atheist funerals. They all still feel that somehow they've been cheated and death is wrong. They have eternity in their hearts. Something inside every human being screams, No! There's got to be more. The deepest need a human being has is to know that their lives mean something. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, I cling to that. I know that every audience already has eternity in their hearts. God gets there first. Isaiah 54, I love this. In the year 1792, a humble shoe cobbler stood up in a, a ministerial meeting, a group of pastors in Northampton, England, and he read this passage, Enlarge the place of your tent, expand the curtains of thy habitations, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you shall break out on the right hand and on the left, and you shall not be ashamed. And he closed his Bible, this shoe cobbler. And he said, I cannot help but think that God is asking us to win the world for Christ. 1792. Within six years, Berthier is going to march on the city of Rome. That humble shoe cobbler's name was William Carey. And after he tried to convince a bunch of Calvinist ministers to do evangelism, and they didn't believe in evangelism because everybody's either saved or lost anyway, he decided, if I'm going to tell them to do it, I'm going to do it. And he got on a ship and went to India and spent the rest of his life in foreign missions, launching almost single-handedly the foreign missionary movement and preparing the way for the last day remnant church born in the middle of the next century. I love these passages. They give me faith. Daniel 12, verse 4. Shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will increase. Some evangelists have done violence to that text, and they tell the audiences, and I, I can't say I've never done it, tell the audience, look at all the modern technology that we've got. It's evidence that this has been fulfilled. We've got space shuttles, or we, we had them, now they're done. We had the Concorde jet, that's gone too. We have the internet, we still have that, and smartphones, and look at all the technology and knowledge that we have, Wikipedia. I mean, well, look at all the knowledge. That is not what Daniel's talking about. Not even close. Many will run to and fro. In the original language, the word used for that is shut. It's kind of like the word shut with an umlaut over the U. You know those two little dots? You know what the word means? It's a reference to rowing a boat back and forth over a stream, but it's a euphemism. They're trying to describe somebody who's carefully studying a text and not missing a single detail. What Daniel is literally saying is that in the time of the end, people will very meticulously, many, it says, will meticulously study the book of Daniel. That gives me hope. I know that if I invite the public to come and study, God has already promised that many will be interested. And if you step out with that faith, many are always interested. I love these texts. Revelation 7. We read that yesterday morning. An innumerable company is the end result so big that you can't count it. Revelation 18, verse 1, another angel comes down from heaven, and the world is illuminated with the glory of God. It tells me that the work is going to end well. I'm going to tell stories this morning, and I'm going to try and wrap up before 4 o'clock. <laughs> I'll let you go on time. Let me tell you some stories that have happened to me in the last 10 years or so. And I've been in a number of different positions in 10 years because I can't hold a job. Australia. A group came to me from Australia and said, can we take some of your videos and put them on the air in Australia? I said, knock yourselves out. I can't help you pay for that, but knock yourselves out. 
So they came back, they said, good news, you're on the air in Australia. I said, well, I, wh where am I on the air in Australia? And I knew the answer was going to be channel 5,432 on some obscure satellite network. They said, no, we got you on channel 7. It's the biggest network in the country. I said, you're kidding. I said, what's the time slot? They said, well, that's the thing. 3.30 in the morning, Sunday. I thought, well, at least the competition isn't all that stiff. You know, you got the George Foreman grill and the thigh master. That's what you have at 3.30 in the morning. And see what happens. They came back a few weeks later. They said, we don't understand it ourselves, but it's now the number one show at 3.30 in the morning. I said, well, look at the competition is the George Foreman grill. If we can't outperform the George Foreman grill, we're in trouble. They came back a few weeks later and they said, this is, this is mind boggling. Australia is one of the most secular nations on earth. It is now the number one religious show in the entire country, the Seventh-day Adventist half hour, and it's got a bigger audience than Hillsong, even though it's on at 3.30 in the morning. We started getting phone calls, God waking people up at 3.30 in the morning on Sunday. I woke up and a voice said, turn on your TV. And it's funny, there was this one show that was about the resurrection of, of, uh, of the, the last day resurrection. And one lady called in panicking because they showed one of those ancient Harry Anderson paintings and it was panning over all the graves. And one lady saw her own name on a tombstone. <laughs> And the grave wasn't open. She called me in panicking. I didn't come up in the resurrection. I need Bible studies. You might not know what you're doing. And believe me, none of us do. But if you take the first step of faith, God answers. The Pacific Northwest, when statisticians try to determine what the religious preference of the Pacific Northwest is, they leave it blank. They can't figure it out. It is one of the strangest places on earth. Those of you who have lived there, I started evangelism in the Pacific Northwest. It is weird there. It's populated by what I call watermelons. Well, Sean, what, why do you say it's populated by watermelons? Well, because they're all green like environmentalists on the outside and red like communists on the inside. That's the population of the Pacific Northwest. And, would it work there? So we did a lot of work up in the Pacific Northwest. What's interesting is I beg God, you never lay your own plans. You ask God to show you His. It doesn't work if you make your own plans. I hope that's been obvious in our last meetings together. Make your own plans, you fail. Ask God to show you His, you win every time. Amen. It is so much easier to tap into what God is already doing than to invent something new. That's why we need to learn the skill of observing a community intently. You'll see that God's at work. So we're praying, where do we go next? And after we're done praying, our team, someone says, hey, we should go to Portland, Oregon. And someone else said, that's strange, I had the same idea. I thought, okay, well, that could be a coincidence. I went back to the office, and the conference president had just left a uh, message on my answering machine. We've been praying today, and we all got the impression we should phone you and invite you to Portland, Oregon. <laughs> all right, we're going to Portland, Oregon. Oh, my word, this is going to be hard. We had protesters that protested the fact that we used handbills. You murdered trees! Never mind they had paper signs to protest it. And... <laughs> Anybody going to come in the Northwest? If you work intentionally, they always come. They always come. If you plan it the day before, they don't, because God doesn't honor people who don't step out by faith and be intentional. But we plan for it. And we got this convention center downtown. It was gorgeous. We couldn't find any place in town for less than half a million dollars in rent. And we don't have a half a million dollars. So we prayed, and someone said, why don't we move the meetings to the five weeks before Easter instead of after? I said, okay, let's try that. Went back into town, went down to the convention center. It's breathtaking. It's gorgeous. It's like my own crystal cathedral. It's got those great big towers on the top, and the lobby is 15,000 square feet. I thought if they let me hold a, a, a meeting in the lobby, I'd be thrilled. And We went in and saw the manager, and I said, we'd like to rent the place. She said, what day would you like? I said, I'd like the month of February. She said, oh, she laughed. She said, we're so booked out years to come, you'd be lucky to get one day. I can only give you a day. I said, but I need a month. She said, let me show you. We don't have a month. And she opened her day book to February of that year, and she blanched because February was completely blank, not a single booking. And she's on the hook for booking the place. She said, I don't understand. There's nothing booked for February. How does that happen? I said, let me tell you how that happens. Angels of God sat in your office holding their finger on that page till I showed up today. She said, that has got to be why it happened. We prayed for an audience. 
Who's going to come in the Pacific Northwest? Bunch of watermelons not going to come to a Bible study. And as I'm in the back on opening night praying, somebody comes to me and says, we've got a problem. I said, what's the problem? The trailblazers are playing across the street and all the parking's full already. I said, oh no, at least, you know, there's a mall just a few blocks down the street. People can park there. It's a nice evening and someone, they, they can walk from the mall down to the auditorium. And that's when Job's second messenger came in and said, it's pouring rain out. And I don't mean a little bit. It's a typhoon. Oh. I thought, well, at least the public transit, the MAX train stops right in front of our door. People can take public transit. And that's when Job's third messenger came in and said, did you hear what happened? No. He said, a bus just hit the train and all the public transit in the whole city shut down. I thought, oh, no, Lord. I talked all these people into doing this. What a disaster. On opening weekend, it looked like this, 2,200 people. People coming in dripping wet, some of them crying, please tell us we didn't miss anything. Audiences are bigger than they have been before. I'm going to skip through this. Los Angeles, this, one's, this would be a really great story for you to know, but we don't have time. <laughs> I got this. We were planning for Los Angeles, and I got an invitation to speak at the Hollywood Bowl for their sunrise Easter service. And I have a bad mood. I'm not doing that. It's going to be an ecumenical thing. I'm going to have to get up at 3 in the morning to go for that. And they're all going to, it's going to be all the religions of the world holding hands, and they're going to sing Kumbaya and release a bunch of doves. I'm not showing up. My wife said, oh, you're going. <laughs> said, no, I'm not going to go to that. She said, you're going. How often do God's people get an invitation to the Hollywood Bowl? So I showed up, bad attitude. I knew everyone got one minute to speak, so I'm sitting in my chair backstage, and in comes the grand pooba of this religion and the high mufti of that religion, and, 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 and I kid you not, they walk in with a crate of doves that they're going to release during the ceremony. Oh, I know it. Oh, I know. And then they hand me a program. I better figure out where my one minute falls. And that's when I discover I'm not one of the speakers. I'm the only speaker. <laughs> I've got the main message, and in my bad attitude, I hadn't pre Oh, I've never repented like that in my whole life. Oh, Lord, I need a sermon, and I need it in six minutes. And got to preach in the Hollywood Bowl about the resurrection of Christ and the second coming and invite that entire audience to our campaign. So we rented the Shrine Auditorium where they used to hold the Oscars and that's not, we didn't get the nice part, we got the exhibit hall in the back. The nice part's expensive and you can't get it. And then we ran an infomercial at two in the morning. You, you should try this, you get the kids to help you make it. It's a cheesy infomercial, and it was like, hey, you ever wondered why your marriage is falling apart? Come to my free seminar, ran a little ad for my meeting. You know, Hurricane Katrina, is this going to happen more and more? Come to my free seminar. You know, I thought, if George Foreman's selling grills, he stays on TV at 2 in the morning year after year, not because he's not moving grills, he's moving them. I thought, I want to talk to that audience. They've got guilty consciences. They're up at 2 in the morning. And we got 4,000 pre-registrations in 30 minutes. Then we panicked, we had 2,000 seats. I said, don't worry, they're free seats. Only half of them are gonna show up. Now we have a full hall. We had a big problem, 3,000 turned out on opening night, 3,000. So the owner of the auditorium says, let's move you into the real shrine auditorium. So I got to preach, there he puts me in the real, you can't really see that. It's the biggest stage in America. It holds 11 circus elephants or one Adventist evangelist. <laughs> 3,000 people, I'm telling you, Get your churches together. Combine your efforts. Talk to each other. Because when God sees a majority of His people take this seriously, He begins to send the interest hand over fist. Eventually, we started to ask ourselves the question, where else would be impossible? I pulled out a globe. I looked at it and I knew the answer, Western Europe. Western Europe, you, we think we're postmodern and secular. Western Europe is it. In some countries, fewer than 3% of people go to church. My family, most of them lives in the old country. They live up in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is very postmodern and secular. I have 48 cousins because my family takes the command to go forth and multiply very seriously. And 48 cousins, we're prolific, the Boonsters. There are places on earth where it's the most common name in town, believe it or not. There's only 100 of us in America. I looked at it and I thought, what would be the toughest community in all of Western Europe? Where could we go 
where nobody could ever say again that my neighborhood is tougher than that. And my heart sank as the truth occurred to me. The toughest neighborhood in all of Western Europe is Rome, Italy. And I prayed about it, oh Lord, no, <laughs> I don't want to, Rome, I like being alive. <laughs> They've got some challenges in that town. Challenge number one, there's a Goliath in the room. <laughs> there are eight Seventh-day Adventist churches in the city of Rome. None of them have more than 100 members. They have between seven and 800 members in that room. There are 1,000 cathedrals in that city. 1,000. That's their first challenge. There's a bit of a Goliath in the room. But you know, God delights in taking down Goliath and answering the prayer of faith. You know, if this was easy and you always knew how it was, people say, it's so hard evangelism. I know, that's what makes it fun. I've mentioned that to you before. If it was predictable, it wouldn't be fun. And if it was predictable, you'd think you were doing it. God wants you to understand that you never touch the walls of Jericho. He brings them down. There's a Goliath in the room. Here's the main church attached to the union office. That's about the whole congregation. It's right on the Tiber River. There's a handful of kids sitting up on the balcony, and I took this picture while I was preaching there one Sabbath. This was my translator, Emanuela. I wanted to just throw this picture in because Emanuela, afterwards, she worked at the UN. She said, hey, um, I used to be a tour guide at the Vatican. How would you like a private tour of the Vatican from an Avenus perspective? I said, nah. I said, are you kidding me? I just wanted you to know that I got that tour, and she no longer lives in Rome, so none of you will ever have that tour. I just wanted you to know that this morning. I saw everything we've ever been told is absolutely true. She, opened, she was the bravest woman I've ever met. Opened all the doors, said, let's go in here. I said, well, are we allowed? No, but let's just go till they kick us out. Tiny, that's challenge. Challenge number two, where are you going to hold a public meeting? There are no venues for rent in that city. We looked at movie theaters with 100 seats, and I thought, that's not visionary enough. You can't. A hundred seats, we've got seven, eight hundred members. Generally speaking, as a starting place, you want to rent an auditorium that holds about as many members as you have, roughly. That's a pretty good starting point for rent. So if you have 2,000 members in a city, rent an auditorium with 2,000 seats. That's roughly the formula, and then you pray that you need double and triple sessions. That's what you do. But that is typically the formula, because about half of church members come faithfully, and the other half is full of interest. So that's kind of roughly. I go bigger if we can go bigger, but you're far better to have a smaller auditorium that you fill three times a night than a big auditorium half full. It's just the message that you send to them. So we went looking. 100 seats, that's not enough. I need at least 800. And we hunted and hunted, and finally we found a high school auditorium. The Leonardo da Vinci Theater in a high school auditorium, 800 seats exactly. I praise the Lord, that's been solved. Took a year and a half to find that place. Now, there was another auditorium that held 2,000 people. It's in the Vatican. It's where the Pope addresses people on Sunday morning, and they won't rent it. I asked. <laughs> so that took a year and a half to solve. Challenge three, advertising. You can't mail handbills in the city of Rome. It's not allowed. It's not possible. It just can't be done. We made a lot of handbills, 800,000 to be exact. I wanted everyone in the city to see one. We designed two, one that I designed, one that the Italians designed, and we tried them in different sections of the city. I'll tell you what this says in a moment. It was a brilliant, brilliant marketing campaign on the, uh, on the behalf of the Italians. But I said, how are we going to get these out? Ikea is out there. I saw them. They send out brochures. How do they get it to the city? There's an Ikea everywhere on earth. It's the Swedish embassy. Kind of like McDonald's is the American embassy. It's everywhere on earth, right? How are we going to get these out? And 100 of your brothers and sisters said, we'll deliver them by hand. 800,000 handbills by hand. They hit 8,000 homes apiece on average. They loaded them in wheeling suitcases and for four weeks headed out on the public transit and gave one to everybody in the city. And when you take that kind of an act of faith, God responds. They were so thorough. I was down at St. Peter's Square and something was stuck to my shoe. I looked down. It was my own handbill. I was standing on my own face and it was stuck to my... They handed them out in the Vatican. When you take that step of faith, God answers. And suddenly we got a call. How would you guys like all the advertising inside all of our buses for the next four weeks? 
We can't afford it. Well, it cost almost nothing. Yes, we'll take it. It's a public transit city. We got another phone call saying, how about all the video monitors down in the subway? Well, that's beautiful. We got those for two weeks in all the subways in the city of Rome. And everybody reads those because when you're packly tight in a subway, everybody's arm up. You don't keep your nose down where the armpits are. You look up at where the, the video monitor is. God started opening doors, but He waits until you take a real step of faith. The waters don't part until you set foot in them. We wait for the miracle first and it's backwards. It's not the pattern you find in the Bible. You act by faith and then the miracles come. Challenge four, the venue again. Well, I thought you solved that one. Yeah, we had a little tiny problem at the Leonardo da Vinci Center. Three days before opening night, I'm riding a bus with some of my friends into the city. My friend's phone rings, he picks it up, he answers it, and his face blanches. He said, we just lost our auditorium. I said, you're kidding, what happened? The Vatican called the manager and told him to kick us out, we're out. He said, we have a legal contract. They said it takes six months to get in front of a judge in this city. So even if you have a legal right, it's over. We're going to have to move the meetings. It's been, the, the former president of Italy found out that that had happened, and he went to the Pope himself and asked them to change their minds. They wouldn't. They wouldn't. So we're kicked out of our hall. The members say, well, let's move it to one of our churches. We'll get buses and have them waiting at the hall, and when people show up, they can get on the buses and go to the meeting at our church. I said, they're not going to get on the buses. I said, why not? Have you ever heard of Jonestown, I said. Would you get on a bus for a religious meeting in an undisclosed location, would you? He said, what choice do we have? So they moved it up the street to one of their churches. Lost my hall. Hmm. Oh yeah, I forgot, I put this in here. I, it took me a few days to find out who was responsible, but I did find out. It wasn't Benedict, though. It was this guy right here. Uh, did you see my halo? I worked like six hours on that. Let me do that again. Where's my halo? Agostino Vellini. He lives at the Lateran Palace. He's the Vicar General of Rome. He takes care of Rome for the Pope because the Pope's busy with world affairs. He's the one who kicked us out. So what happens next? Now I'm desperate. And the media catches wind that the Vatican has kicked somebody out of an auditorium and tried to cancel their event. And the media, well, I, let me come back to that in a moment. <laughs> Hold that thought. Challenge five. I have all of the slides and uh, meetings translated into Italian, and the night before opening night, somebody bumps my computer, it falls off the pulpit, and it smashes like this, and it won't turn back on. I tried to do CPR, you know, <laughs> mouth to mouth with the DVD slot, didn't work. Everything gone. I learned something that day, back up your work. We ended up having to rebuild each meeting the night before, through the night, every night for a month. Back up your work. I lost everything the day before. So now what? I've got no meetings. I've got no hall. I've got nothing. But it's when you've poured your heart into God's work that He opens the floodgates of heaven and pours His heart into you. We moved up the street to this Romanian Seventh-day Adventist church on Via Namantana, out of town. That was an old movie theater on the top. Pizzeria here, that's handy on Saturday night. Everybody bails out of church the minute the sun goes down, down to the pizzeria here. Have, and there's a bank down on the bottom. And this is all the advertising we have left. One banner left hanging on the site. 800,000 handbills with the wrong address. One banner to tell people where we are. I stood outside, I had to laugh because the Italian, the Italian marketing campaign used this phrase. It said, relax, it's only the apocalypse. <laughs> That's pretty good advertising, by the way. That's a great handbill. Relax, it's only the apocalypse. And I had to laugh. I said, Lord, this is the apocalypse. My career is finished. <laughs> it's all over now. The stairs going up to the meetings were poorly lit. I got in a taxi saying, could you take me to such and such a hall? It's on uh, Piazza Volture up here at the top. That's Piazza Volture. No parking there because the apartments use it all. And the taxi drivers couldn't find Piazza Volture. And I thought, if the taxi drivers can't find our hall, who's going to find our hall? Nobody. And I laughed. It's Piazza Volture. It means the plaza of the vulture. I thought, well, my career's over. This is where the vultures are going to pick the meat off my bones. <laughs> Inside is nice, though. It's a former movie theater. It's got the most comfortable seats. Preachers, you know, you don't want comfortable seats in your congregation because, well, you want people to stay awake. But it was nice. Here we are, 
two nights before opening night, my laptop is on top of the piano, it's just died, it's expired. There's only one thing left to do. Give it all back to God. We got on our knees and we begged God into the night. There's no way to fix this anymore. No way to fix this anymore. That's when the miracle started to happen. The media heard that the Pope had kicked someone out of their auditorium. And they don't like the Vatican, the media. And so they gave me two hours of national airtime across the entire country to explain what we would be doing. First show, they were pretending I was on location in America. I didn't realize they were lying about where I was. They stepped me over here. And she had just seen the 2012 movie. Remember that? The Nostradamus 2012 movie. And, and she wanted to know how the world was going to end. So I gave a Bible study on the book of Revelation on live TV across the entire country and invited the whole country to come to the meetings. Then I got invited to a communist <laughs> TV station, and they were making fun of me. Oh, we're going to get the preacher in. They put the monkeys behind my head while I was talking. And... First question, why does the Pope hate you? I said, I have no idea. I, I've never met the guy. It was Benedict. I've never met him. I, I don't know why. What are you going to teach that he hates? I said, I don't know. It seems like good news to me. And so I gave a, a presentation on how Revelation isn't about destroying the human race. It's about saving the human race, and it's a God of love. And, and by the end of it, they quit making fun of me. I'm used to being made fun of, that's fine, but by the end, his expression had changed, and when the cameras went off, the cameraman put down his headphones on the handle, and he said, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm going. I'm going to those meetings. Opening night comes. This is me on opening night. Here's the truth about me. I'm scared out of my mind. I'm in the back praying and begging God, if there's still a way to let me out of this, please let me go home. Uh, it, I, I get on any flight that you can arrange, Lord, because this is, oh my goodness, what have I signed up for? It seemed like such a good idea in committee, but on opening night, it sure doesn't seem like a very good idea anymore, and please God. And there's the truth about me. I'm a human being. I'm scared of this. You'd be out of your mind not to be a little scared in Rome. And we're begging, and then it starts to rain. It rains so hard that it's like a typhoon again. And I'm thinking, okay, if the devil hates it this much, this is going to be good. The members put out umbrellas for everybody and started to pray, please send them. And they started to pack into the auditorium. Oh, why is my remote stop? There we go. Oh, let me back up. Suddenly caught up, and they started to pack in, and they started to pack in, and they filled the auditorium, and they filled the balcony, and they filled the overflow room in the basement. We had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people pour into those meetings. And people were telling me the whole time, don't you understand, only immigrants go to meetings. Only old people go to meetings. Look at their faces. They're listening to Daniel chapter 2 in a postmodern secular society where it can't possibly work, and they're hanging on every word because they have never heard anything like it before. It had been 45 years since it had been preached in that city. Don't discount the people who live around you. They're desperate for a real answer because they're also watching the same news feeds you're watching and they don't have anything to cling to. They'll come. Here's the balcony, also full. Here's the meeting. Not the same night, but one month later, still standing room only at the back. Really, you did a whole month of meetings? Yes. Quit telling yourself people won't come. They'll come and they'll stay. They stayed five weeks and it's still standing room only. It's amazing what God will do. Then the enemy got mad. Someone started slashing tires in the parking lot to intimidate our guests. I got a phone call from an Adventist stateside who heard about it. He said, don't you worry. Tell the people I'll replace every tire that gets slashed. And I was a little bit hesitant, because you know how cheap Adventists are, right? Some of these saints are going to be, boy, my tires are getting a little thin. I, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We went into the tire business. We started replacing tires. The people kept coming. We had record-setting snow. It doesn't snow in Rome, but once in 20 years. As the Sabbath presentation was coming, record-setting snow. I was on a bus, and the bus driver stopped and kicked everybody off the bus because he was scared of driving in the snow. I'm in a suit. I got two miles to go to the hall in, in, in like eight. I thought, I'm a Canadian. Let me drive the bus. I'll get it to where it's going. I, big chicken. One night, I'm at a... Oh, we're going to be good. We're going to be good. Is this interesting? Yes. Good. It's because it's all I planned. <laughs> I got there one night, and I couldn't hear myself think. There was a rock concert going on down the street from our auditorium. 
unbelievably loud. The pictures on the walls were moving where we were up the hill. The concert was in Piazza Sempioni down the hill, and it's a well-known place. And so they had a great big rock festival, and they closed the entire section of the city, closed all the roads, so it was only open to pedestrians. I thought, oh, what's that going to do to our attendance? And now we're talking about testing truths in the meeting. People aren't going to be able to hear what I'm saying. It's that loud. And I won't be able to think. I, I brought earplugs. I'll put them in. And I preached that night, and the strangest thing happened. The moment we started presenting the message, it fell dead silent. Dead silent in the auditorium. And the moment I said amen, you could hear the rock concert again. And I thought, that's strange. Did their power go out? I went out and I said, what happened with that rock concert? Did it shut down? They said, Pastor, it didn't shut down. You could still hear it in the lobby the whole time and in the bathrooms the whole time, in the parking lot the whole time. But the moment you set foot in the sanctuary, it was like somebody had put their hand over the sanctuary and you couldn't hear it in here. God will invest in your faith, but you're going to have to exercise it. Amen. Visiting people? How do you visit people in Rome, Italy? Those who have been there know how hard it is to get around from house to house. You'll be lucky to see two people in a day on a Vespa. So one pastor said, why don't we ask him to meet you here at the auditorium? I said, well, let's try. And so he went over to one man. He said, would you be willing to meet with Sean? And the guy looked up at me and he said, well, how much time would you have for me? Would you have 15 minutes? I said, 15 minutes? I was thinking an hour, hour and a half. Full-grown man began to cry like a baby. He said, you'd spend an hour with me? I'll shut down my business. I'll be here. His appointment was 2 in the afternoon. I looked out. He was in the parking lot by 11 a.m. so that he wouldn't be late. He sat in his car three hours waiting, and it was one after the other, after the other, after the other. We're missing the ripe fruit because we're not paying attention. There's more of them out there than you think there is. And we spend all of our time focused on who doesn't respond. And meanwhile, there are millions who will. There are millions who will. It was remarkable what took place. There's our visitation meeting. Let me wrap it up like this. The big miracle wasn't that lots of people came. I asked God for 10 decisions. It was such a small goal. But you've got to understand it's Rome, Italy, and even 10 would have turned that church upside down. If we get 10 or 15, we had 144 by closing night. This is what altar calls look like. This is one of those places where people got out of their seats before I ever made an appeal because they thought there might be one and they didn't want to miss it. I, 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 well, you can't see all my little bouncy balls that I just dropped on everybody's head. I remember this lady. We started an appeal. She got out of her seat, walked down to the front. And then partway through the appeal, she turned around, went back, sat down, changed her mind. I thought, well, oh, no, you don't. So I kept the appeal going, and I looked right at her. She got out of her seat, came down again. She came four times before she stayed. <laughs> but I kept it going until she came. She made a decision. This woman here, State of the Dead, got her. She said, my child died. Is he okay? She said, don't you see the children climbing on Jesus' lap? Don't you assume he's okay with your kid? Your kid's going to be just fine. She made a decision that night. Muslim woman, 32, walks in. First meeting is the state of the dead. Afterwards, she said to me, came down front, I got to talk to you. I said, I imagine you might. <laughs> she said, that's the only thing I've ever made since. Is there anyone in this building who could help me become a Christian tonight? I said, what's going to happen to you when your family finds out? They'll kill me, but it doesn't matter. One after the other. We discount the public. Don't tell yourself people won't respond. If you don't believe this will work, it won't period. The number one reason it doesn't work is because we tell ourselves it won't. But if you take a step by faith, I'm promising you it works. This guy sitting in the corner ran a radio show. He's the Art Bell or the George Norrie of Europe. He runs a show about UFOs and Sasquatches and, and late night radio. He made a decision. He's an interesting character. At the very end, he says, we don't even know if Jesus was real, he said to me. I said to myself, there's no way you come 25 nights and, and you don't think any of this is real. You wouldn't keep coming for 25 nights. So we opened a Bible. I'll call him Giovanni. I said, Giovanni, you might be right. You always give people the benefit of the doubt and give them space to say no. You might be right, but let me ask you a question. Do you hope this book is true or do you hope it's not? And he started to cry because I know there's eternity in every human heart. He said, I'd be a fool to want that book not to be true. 
So then we can start. God sent you here for a reason. You know he's real. We'll work through the details. One after the other. There's a barber down here. I love this guy. He said, I want to keep the Sabbath, but I have a barber shop. Saturday's my busiest day. So we started to visit him. We got so many haircuts that none of us had any hair left by the time the meeting was over. I had just like I had a little military buzz cut. And we kept sending Bible workers in to get more haircuts and more haircuts and more haircuts. He said, I need a year to wind down my Saturday business one day when I was sitting in his barber chair. I said, oh, I feel bad, man. So why do you feel bad? I said, because I brought you a gift. And I opened my briefcase. I pulled out a sign that said, now close Saturdays. I had made it for him. And he said, oh, that makes it so hard. I said, you need to just trust God. You talk to him about it. I'm not here to tell you what to do. You listen to God. And we left, and I told the Bible worker on the way out, next Sabbath, if he's not in church, get a lawn chair. Come down to his barber shop, sit in front of his window, and read a Bible all day long. Just do it so he can see you. Make sure he's sit right where he can see you. And he didn't come to church, they did that. He felt so horrible by closing time that he closed his barber shop forever. He's a mile from the Vatican. He said to me, he said, I've done it on Sundays now. I'm open. I'm the busiest barber shop in the city. Business has never been better. A nuclear physicist sitting up on the balcony. Oh, you can't reach those people, right? You can't reach them. He was so interested in what he was hearing, he had his cell phone with him. He sat by a speaker so that he could hold the cell phone into a speaker and send it to a group of his friends 200 miles away so they wouldn't miss a word. He had a small group listening in with him. He made a decision. Don't tell yourself it doesn't work or it won't. Exercise some faith and you will suffer disappointments. It happens every time. The Egyptians will appear on the horizon. You will see their dust and you will think it's over. Step in the water anyway and see what God does. Amen. One after the other, oh, the stories here. This woman said, my husband's going to throw me out of the house if I make a decision, but I can't not make a decision. I'm joining God's remnant church. One after, this young couple, Nina and Nelu, her father taught philosophy at the university, an atheist. Can't win young people, can't win postmoderns, but here she is. She says, I, I don't know what the big fuss is. I love Jesus. This is the best thing I've ever heard. I want to join. Found out they were shacked up. I said, well, we got to get you married. She said, okay, but it's going to take like six months to get a wedding license in this city. In Italy, everything goes so slow. <laughs> I said, it's going to take six months. I said, well, we can't have that. We need you married now. So we got them bus tickets. We sent them to another country where they could get married overnight and then brought them back. And Don't laugh. I've rented a bus here in the U.S. because... We had a whole bunch of undocumented guests, and they didn't want to get married because they didn't want the government to know. So we rented a bus, sent them to a state where they didn't have to tell the government they could get married, and come back. I called it the, the, the evangelism love bus. <laughs> <laughs> Invest in people. God gave you your resources for these people, not for new carpet. They say, well, we can't, we can't separate before we get married because we can't afford two rents. Then find them a place to live. Pay the first month's rent. Get a moving truck together. Invest in these people. Jesus spent so much on us. If you invest in them, they join. I promise you, they're hungry. They want to know that you're God's family, one after the other. After it was over, I'm glad I didn't know during the meetings, I found out that someone was broadcasting every meeting to the entire city, including deep into the Vatican every single night. And the phone at the church started to ring off the hook, two, three hundred phone calls a day. Who are you people and how can we learn more? Two, three hundred a day. Audiences are bigger than they ever have been before. We have the right message. We have every method we need. We've been given all the counsel we need and we're only missing one thing. Courage. Courage. We cower the first time an enemy fires a shot. If we'd fought World War II that way, <laughs> stay the course, step in the water. God always catches you. Amen. In recent years, I had three months to get ready for a meeting in Indianapolis, 1300 opening night. We had about 10 months to get ready for Minneapolis, 1700 opening night. They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Pool your resources, work together, talk to each other. You'd be amazed what happens when God's people say we're in. We'll all do it. I promise you, he's going to catch you. I know it's scary. I still get scared. I talk a big game up here, but I open in Seattle in six weeks. And I know I'm going to throw up opening night. Always do. Because it scares the stuffing out of me. 
But every time I do it, my faith grows a little bit more because He's never, ever failed to catch me. Amen. Father in heaven, we're about to go from this place where we talked about it, and we're going to go back to our communities now where your ripe fruit is waiting. Your children are sitting on the edge of the kingdom. Some of them are desperate. They put up a brave face so we don't see it, but some of them are desperate to come home. And in the stillness of this moment, we have all heard you speak to our hearts. We've heard presentations this weekend. We've studied your word this weekend, and we have heard you speak to us. So we want to take a first faltering step of faith and say, I'm not sure how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. I'll step in the water. As you've been listening in your seat, have you felt Jesus tap you on the shoulder saying, this is your moment. I need you in my movement. Maybe you don't know what you're going to do, but if you're going to do it, would you rise to your feet wherever you are? Father in heaven, I know angels are rejoicing as they watch the army of God assemble in this auditorium. It's that moment. We don't know how long we've got, Lord. You know the answer to that. But fill our hearts with faith. Ignite a fire in our souls that refuses to be discouraged. And show us somebody who's ripe. Someone on the verge of coming home. And again, with our hearts racing wildly, we'll say a few words and meet that person and invite them home. And soon we'll all rejoice together when we're at long last home celebrating with the people we have had the privilege of introducing to you. Bless each person here, I ask. Let it happen this week in their lives. Open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears, and may Jesus come soon. For we pray it in His holy name. Amen. Let's sing that chorus, I've decided to follow Jesus, and we'll sing just the first one, and I'll mouth the words so you don't have to hear anything that... And as soon as we're done singing that chorus, you are dismissed. God bless you. Thanks for putting up with me and our team for the weekend. Let's sing that. So who can sing? Who can start us? Godspeed. God go with you. Go out there and get them until we meet again. Thanks so much.